sections of navigable Lehigh River water. But for our purposes today, we're just going to refer to it as the canal. Patience is a virtue. That's right. Gentlemen nailed it 100%. We're not going anywhere without the mules, and here they come a little ahead of schedule. But if you want to take a picture, this is a good time because it's about the only time on the ride that you're going to see their faces. Andrea, let them know that we're waiting, please. That's George in the front being led by Mr. Milo Hank in the mule? back, mm -hmm. the Captain and Doug. Mules on our canal traditionally walk one behind the other. It's called walking in tandem. There was two-way traffic on the canal, and that meant two-way traffic on the towpath. And the towpath was not wide enough for two sets of mules to walk to a breast. Mules look similar to horses. Yeah. Actually, I want to sit over here. Are they like a cross of a donkey and a horse? Yes. Really? Does the same mule always take the front? On with us, yes. It's because um, of Hank and George. George is somewhat the more mellow mule. There's not a lot that really upsets him. Hank is a little bit tenser. So we have found that putting George in front is, it solves a lot of problems. It avoids a whole lot more. But normally, um, when the canal was in operation, boats being pulled by mules, they would swap out. All right, the way the mules are going to take us up and down the canal today is with the tow line. Captain Doug has one end of that long rope in his hand and he's attaching it to the tow bar behind Hank's hind legs. And the other end of that long line is attached to a cleat here on the bow of the boat. I think we still have people. That's it? All right. All right. Now before you start to feel sorry for the mules and what you might imagine is going to be a very torturous, difficult job ahead of them, I direct your attention to our plethora of crewmates on the dock. Some of those individuals are going to be moving this 96,000 pound boat by themselves, not. And they're going to do it the hard way, moving it sideways through the water, but they're going to move it the same way that the mules move it by leaning their weight against it. Because of the uh, principles of buoyancy and the lack of friction on the water, it doesn't take much force to get a boat moving. And Hank and George are gonna move it just the same way. They're gonna lean their considerable 1,100 pounds into the thick leather collars that rest on their shoulders and their chests. And their energy transfers through the harness and up the tow line to the rope. Mm -hmm. All right. As soon as the boat clears the dock, Hank and George are going to start off down the tow path, dragging that 150 foot long tow line behind them. Tug. You feel it. When you feel the tug of the rope go. So. It'll be a while because they have to get out. Really for the, uh, so we're aboard the canal boat going for the 45 minute ride. All right. When the boys get towards the end of the line, they're going to pick it up. And when they do, the line will go taut right about now. And there's a tug. With that tug, the boat breaks inertia, starts moving forward. Now Hank and George are going to take some short, stiff-like steps to get us up to our cruising speed of two miles an hour. 
And as long as they walk along and keep tension in the toe line, the boat will start to gain momentum. The longer they walk on, the more momentum the boat gathers. And that's the secret to how two mules can pull a heavy canal boat. The momentum of the boat does as much work as they do. They were moving. Yep. Now, our boat, the Josiah White II, is not like the boats that carried cargo on this canal in the 19th and early 20th century. Our boat was built in 1993 specifically for carrying passengers. We're 50 feet long and 22 feet wide. We have a steel hull that gives us most of our 48 ton weight. We're lucky enough to have a canvas top to keep us out of the elements, lines along the side to keep us from falling in the canal. The boats of the day were a lot different. They were much longer than our boat, usually 87 feet long, but they were only about as half as wide as the Josiah White II, 10 and a half to 11 feet. They were all wood when they were empty. They weighed about 20 tons. They didn't have a canvas top and no lines along the side. Their upper decks were lined with large hatches that you open to load and unload your cargo below deck. And those boats, when they were fully loaded, could carry up to 100 tons of cargo. Mules on this canal regularly pulled loads of up to 120 tons, and they did it for an 18-hour workday. Now, that sounds really excessive, but in fact it isn't. And you don't have to believe me, believe Benjamin Franklin. Franklin was the ambassador to France during the Revolution, and he became very interested in European canals because he knew that a canal system was going to be very important for the growth of the young United States. He learned everything he could, and one of the things he figured out mathematically is that one mule can pull a load of 65 tons as long as that weight is on water. Just to give you a comparison, to show you what uh, ease it was to move heavy loads on, the, on, on, on water, uh, to move the heaviest land vehicle at the turn of the 19th century, the uh, Conestoga wagon loaded with 10 tons of cargo, it was going to take 16 mules or oxen and they weren't going to go two miles an hour. Moving heavy, bulky cargo on water is the fastest, the easiest, and the most efficient way to move that cargo, at least in the first half of the 19th century before the coming of commercial railroad. And mules were the only animal who could have pulled that load for that distance and that duration. The reason mules are so good at pulling canal boats is because they know how to pace themselves. Mules learn very rarely in their working career that by walking at a pace of two miles an hour, they could pull a boat for an 18 hour workday, cover 22 miles doing it without injuring or exhausting themselves. It's the mule's natural pace. Now the mules have stopped. And of course there's a train coming. Yep. perfect example of why we have mule tenders walking with the boys. The bank and George were left to their own devices, they be over the tall weeds on the stack. And as you can see, the boat keeps on moving, even when the animals are stopped. If they were over in the tall grass and the boat kept moving, they would get dragged into the canal and with their heavy harnesses and the steep banks of the canal, the end would be disastrous. So, our mule tenders are there to make sure that the boys don't get into those things because they injure themselves. The Tanzania is making a turn that couldn't have been made by the boats of the day. At 87 feet, they were too long to make a 180 degree turn in our 60 foot wide canal. They have to go out onto a basin in the river in order to change directions. 
But by using the tiller, and with a little bit of help from the mules, she should be able to accomplish this maneuver quickly and easily. It's all spinning. Mm -hmm. Making yeah. a big one now the hardest that mules work on our boat ride is about nine minutes because there are three times on this ride when they have to get a boat moving forward. Again, once they get it moving, the momentum of the boat takes care of the rest. solve any problem that the mules can't solve themselves. Because you see, on a canal, the only way a canal boat captain made any money and the only way the canal company made any money was by having boats constantly in motion, picking up and delivering cargo. So you wanted your mules to be healthy and happy all of the time. Human beings had to participate in the care of those mules. Mules burn a lot of calories pulling a heavy canal boat, and they needed to be fed every four hours. But you didn't want to stop to feed them. So someone on the deck of the canal boat would fill two feed bags, throw them onto the towpath. The mule tender would put them around the mule's necks, and they would walk and eat at the same time, which is great because walking and eating are the two things that mules do the best. Must be a third thing. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's a family audience. We run into this problem all the time. Um, wait till we talk about sanitation on the boat. Um, and when I say that mules walked for an eight for 18 hours a day, it was not a continuous 18 hours. There were 47 locks on this canal, locks that raised or lowered your boat so you could come overcome the elevation change on this and on other canals. So when you came to a lock, one of those 47 locks, 
There were 200 boats sailing on this 47 mile long system every day and the chances were pretty good that you were going to have to stop to wait your turn to get into the lock and that's when mules got to rest. Because mules are like all equines, they can lock their knees and sleep standing up. And there was a rule on this canal to protect the mules. One of the founders of this canal, Josiah White, was a very devout Quaker, and he believed in the humane treatment of animals. He knew that if the captain was allowed to rent a pair of mules, that he would abuse them. He'd overwork them, he'd underfeed them, he wouldn't give them the rest or the medical attention that they might need, because if they were too exhausted or damaged to pull his boat, why, he could just trade them in for another pair. So on this canal, whether you owned your own boat or what was more likely, you leased one from the canal company, you had to own your own mules. That way, even the most unscrupulous captain was forced to take good care of his team because if he didn't, and the boats were, then the, the, the mules were too damaged or injured to pull the boat, well, he didn't make any money. And he had no recourse. He only had himself to blame. This canal was built for a specific purpose. It was built to bring anthracite coal down from the Pocono Mountains, the cities of Philadelphia and New York. This is anthracite. It's the super fossil fuel. It's 98% carbon, which means that it burns very hot. It burns for a very long time. And it burns without visible smoke. That made it very attractive in those big cities. Because in Philadelphia, which was the largest city in North America at the turn of the 19th century, you burned wood or charcoal in your house, it made you, the inside of your house, and everything in it a sooty, smoky mess. The iron industry in America was based in Philadelphia. They were using soft, bituminous coal to make iron. That coal came from down in Virginia and the Carolinas. It was sailed down rivers to the coast loaded on large boats and sailed up to the Delaware Bay. But bituminous coal is high sulfur coal. It puts off a lot of smoke, a lot of soot, a lot of grime. It coated the city in a thick layer of dirt. They really wanted that clean burning fuel, but there of course were problems. The first was that the anthracite was 100 miles away and there was no easy way to get it to Philadelphia, certainly not over land. The Lehigh River flows past the coal fields up in Ma Chunk, current Jim Thorpe. The first people to get it out of the ground decided to build rafts and sail it down the Lehigh River. But the Lehigh is shallow, rocky, dangerous, and fast, and for every two rafts they put on the river, they were lucky if one of them made it all the way to Philadelphia. And if your raft did make it, well, rivers are one way, so you had to sell your cargo, take your raft apart, and sell the timber, and then the crew had to walk back to the coal field. It wasn't a very efficient way to move anthracite. And besides, the inherent problem with anthracite is that it is almost impossible to get ignited, and very difficult to get burning, hot enough to be of any use. The only people who could use it were blacksmiths, because with their forges, their open forges and their bellows, they could force enough air into an anthracite fire to get it ignited, get it hot enough to work metal. But for the most, most part, the anthracite just sat up in the Pocono Mountains, forgotten and unused. From 18, or 1790, when it was first discovered by Europeans, until the middle of the second decade of the 19th century. In 1812, we went to war with Great Britain. They wanted their colonies and their colonists back, and to get them, they used their navy to blockade the Atlantic seaboard. It meant nothing could be exported from the United States to be sold in Europe. Nothing that they needed in the, in the United States could be imported from Europe. It was designed to uh, just cut off this country economically from the rest of the world, and the blockade had the extra added attraction of cutting off the movement of the bituminous coal coming up from the south for the iron industry in Philly. It meant that the iron industry, who had to make the weapons of war, had to rely on charcoal as a fuel. And charcoal is made by baking the moisture out of hardwood trees. It takes an acre of hard, pardon me, it takes two acres of hardwood to make enough charcoal 
to smelt one ton of iron, which is no iron at all. By 1814, there just weren't any trees left between Philadelphia and the Blue Mountains. They'd all been cut down. And we were going to lose our independence because we had an energy crisis. We couldn't make iron. Luckily, Great Britain called off the war in late 1814 to go back and fight Napoleon. And that's when the heroes of our story show up. Josiah White and Erskine Hazard. They had a small iron furnace down in Philadelphia. They were affected by this energy crisis, so they were using lousy charcoal to smelt enough iron to make wire and nails. But being smart men, educated men, they knew about the anthracite, they knew about its properties, and they knew that because the anthracite was located in the interior of the country, that the movement of that fuel couldn't be interfered with by a foreign power. But there's the problem. Getting anthracite to burn hot enough to separate iron from the ore it's encased in. Great Britain had been doing it for over a hundred years. They had invented what they called the hot blast system. They would use turbine engines powered by steam, first water and then steam engines, to force air into the base of their fire. It would get the kindling burning hot enough to ignite the anthracite. And the hotter the anthracite got, the more air was pumped in there, but he helped dig and engineer the Erie Canal across upstate New York. He came down here with five, with a thousand Irish immigrant laborers, 500 local German farmers got hired because they were going to have to dig this canal by hand. But young Mr. White had a lot of innovations in mind that he thought would make the job quicker, easier, and more economical. He built the canal to be as far away from the river as possible, so when the river flooded, it didn't flood over the banks of this canal. He followed the terrain. He needed to dig a ditch eight feet deep and 60 feet wide, but by using the uphill slope of the hillsides he sailed along, he only needed to dig down four feet, move all the rock and dirt 60 feet across, and he ended up with his eight foot deep ditch in half the time, half the effort, and half the money. He knew this canal was going to leak, soil in eastern Pennsylvania is very porous, but he knew that his men were going to excavate set, um, deposits of clay as they dug each section of canal, when a section like this two and a half mile long uh, section we sail on was finished, they would take the clay, mix it with sand and water to create a sticky paste that they spread out three feet thick along the bottom and the sides of the canal. White knew that clay was water resistant and he knew that the tighter he packed down that clay, the tighter that waterproof seal would be. He didn't have anything mechanical to do the job, he actually had something better. He had sheep. Sheep's feet are perfectly designed for packing down earth. So he hired every farmer to bring in the Lehigh Valley to bring their flocks of sheep to a canal bed where they would walk them up and down on the wet clay until it was packed down two feet thick. And then he had what he set out to have, a six foot deep, 60 foot wide canal. Over there is the Glendon Dam, built by the Army Corps of Engineers to replace one of nine original dams that White built between Easton and Wachunk. And the dams did two things. They took the shallow, rocky, dangerous Lehigh and backed it up, making it deeper, wider, and slower. So when you got to the end of a section of canal, you could go through the guard lock gates, like the ones ahead of us. They didn't raise or lower your boat. They simply allowed your boat to go safely onto and off of the river. You got out on the banks of the river and your mules could pull you for two miles along the banks of that slow, deep Lehigh River. Two miles of navigable Lehigh River times nine dams is 18 miles of canal. You didn't have to dig by hand. The other thing the dams do is create a huge reservoir of water behind each dam. Water that came into each section of canal through openings at the bottom of a big stone wall, like the one to our left. At the bottom are feeder gates. You can see Lehigh River water rippling in. There are flat wooden gates on the other side, and you can control the flow of water from the river into the canal. But because of the design of the dams, there was always water behind them. And that meant this canal never ran dry in 110 years it was in operation. With all of his I I innovations, young Mr. White finished this canal three years ahead of schedule 
thousands of dollars under budget. The canal company, when this canal opened in 1829, had 200 boats ready to carry cargo. And the first rule in the canal boat captain's handbook is that as you approach the lock, you had to signal the lock tender. didn't signal the lock tender, you got fined because you had to stop if those gates were closed and all the boats behind you had to stop and nobody makes money when boats aren't moving. So you wanted something really loud to blow because with 47 locks you were going to lose all your profit paying fines and this is what you wanted. Hot shell. Cut off the end, I got a natural sound chamber and you know how to blow it right, it can be heard for over a quarter mile of open water. And because it's the home to an animal that lives at the bottom of the sea, like SpongeBob SquarePants, it means that it doesn't rust. And anything you can have on a boat that doesn't rust is very valuable. When the lock tender heard that horn, he would come out of the lock tender's house. He was an employee of the canal company. He and his family lived in a house next to each of those 47 locks. They heard the horn, they would come out, go to those red roof sheds by each of those three to six ton lock gates. Those sheds protect a very simple set of gears, rack and pinion gearing that was perfected on this canal. Before rack and pinion gearing, on other canals, it took four strong men with a counterbalance system 20 minutes to get a boat in and out of a lock. But with that gearing, anyone of average strength could open and close those locks and get a boat in and out of them in five minutes. This was a privately funded operation and it had to operate as efficiently and as economically as possible. Lock tender didn't make a lot of money, so he usually had to leave the locks in the care of his family. They had to keep traffic moving in and out of the locks, up and down the canal from 4 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night, the hours of operation. You really didn't have to go far to find a good job, at least not after 1840. Because in 1840, America's Industrial Revolution began along this canal. In 1838, Great Britain decided to sell the patent for an anthracite-fired furnace, and Mr. Hazard went to Great Britain to buy the patent. But when he got there, he realized that the process was so involved that what he really needed was someone with experience using the hot glass system. He found such a man, a young man named David Thomas, a Welshman. Mr. Hazard and Mrs. Um, Thomas convinced him that his future and his fortune lay in the United States. The canal company gave him a plot of land up in what is now Catasauqua, between the river and the canal, because he was going to have to use water power to run the turbines to force air into his furnace. It was a very primitive system, and under very primitive conditions, he built that first class furnace. Six. The Lehigh Valley Railroad went through right next to the canal on strong iron rails and strong wheels and the strong boilers made from the iron that was made on this side of the canal. Trains could carry heavier loads than canal boats. They could carry them further and faster. Unlike canal boats, they didn't have to stop for the winter. This canal had to close every year in late November because especially in the northern reaches, it would start to freeze. If you left water in the canal, the ice would damage the clay lining, the banks, the lock gates, and any boat left in it. So in late November, traffic stopped. Boats were put in docks out on the Lehigh, which moves fast and doesn't freeze. The feeder gate that lets water in from the river was closed. Waste gates that acted like drains built into the side of the canal were open. All the water flowed back into the Lehigh River. And the canal sat empty until the beginning of April. By the 1870s, railroads had put most of the canals in America out of business. They simply couldn't compete. The extensive canal system in America just shut down. Most of the canals were gone, but not this one. 
the agent of the demise of the canal system. Because even after steel replaced iron as the material of choice and the iron businesses along this canal started to close, the canal company still owned the coal fields. And all the cities and towns along this canal depended on anthracite to heat their homes and to power their businesses. The canal was slowly but surely affected by those changes in technology. Railroads, large trucks that could carry coal much further than just the banks of the canal. Finally, the change from anthracite to heating oil was the preferred fuel. Section by section, this canal started to close. It wasn't economically feasible to keep repairing sections damaged by storms and floods. This was the last section to have boat traffic, and that stopped in the early 1930s. But by opening the feeder gate that lets water in from the river and opening the lock gates at the far end of this canal, the flow of water powered hydroelectric plant that gave Southeast and its electricity. It was Hurricane Diane in 1955 that destroyed this last section of the canal, and eventually the canal company just went out of business. But before we leave the canal, we do have to talk a little bit about the people who made their livings on this canal. The boats that carried cargo were captained by family men. The company wanted reliable, sober men. They didn't want sailors. Sailors had a horrible reputation in the 19th century. They wanted men who were going to make deliveries on time, who were going to take care of the boat, who wouldn't steal the cargo because their families' lives depended on them doing a good job. And because most of the men in the Lehigh Valley were farmers, you had a captain who knew how to take care of the engines, the mules. But these guys didn't want to be canal boat captains because it meant being away from home for the nine months that the canal was open. It was a day and a half journey from the coal fields up in, in, in um, Wachung down to the city of Easton. In Easton, you got on the Delaware Canal, and in four days, you were down in Philadelphia, where you crossed the Delaware in Easton to Phillipsburg, got on the Morris Canal, and in four to five days, you are on the Jersey side of New York Harbor. The only way you made money was by constantly being on the move, and these guys didn't want to be away from their families. So the canal company said, bring them with you. Each canal boat had a small cabin at the stern big enough for you to sleep in out of the elements, big enough to keep your provisions and your equipment dry. The canal boat became the family home and the family business. While father was the legal captain of the boat, it was a family business and everybody worked. His wife could steer, dock, and get the boat ready for loading and unloading just as well as he could. They had big families on these boats. Mom had to cook for them on a small stove on the upper deck. It was big enough to cook meals upon, but not big enough to bake in. So for baked goods, fresh vegetables, clean laundry, everything she needed for her boat, her family, and her mules, she relied on lock tenders' wives, and they supplemented their families' incomes by providing all the goods and services that boats needed in order to keep moving. They had a lot of kids. Life on a canal boat for a kid under the age of seven was pretty nice, as long as you didn't fall off. And they tied a rope around your waist, so at least they could pull you back up on the, on the deck if you did. But when a kid turned seven, they went to work, just like all poor kids in America. And if you were a canal boat kid, your job was the mules. You got up at three o'clock every morning, walked from wherever your father's boat had been tied up along the canal, to wherever the mules had spent the night, usually a stable at a lock tender's house. When you got there, you fed them, you brushed all the mud and dirt off them from the day before, you cleaned out their hooves, you put on their heavy leather and wooden harnesses and had them back at your dad's boat by 4 a.m. because that's when the canal opened for business. And then someone has to walk with those mules for the next 18 hours, and it's not going to be mom and dad. So you hoped that you had a lot of brothers and sisters so you could take turns walking the mules because when it got to be at least 10 o'clock and the canal started to close for the day, you tied up your dad's boat, you unhitched the mules, walked them to the next stable, 
took off their harnesses, and then you could go to sleep. Get up the morning, next morning at 3 a.m., do it all again, six days a week. The canal was closed on Sundays, nine months out of the year. But there was a huge advantage to being a canal boat kid. Because the canal closed in the winter, families had to find jobs and accommodations on shore. And that was when canal boat kids got to go to school. Most kids in the 19th century didn't get an education. It wasn't mandatory. And besides, you went to work when you were seven or eight, and you worked until you died. You didn't have to be smart. You just had to be incredibly lucky. Because they gave little kids the most dangerous jobs in coal mines and factories where they were going to lose fingers and limbs in their lives. Because, well, you know, what the heck? There's always more where they come. But a canal boat kid learned how to read, write, and do mathematics. When a boy turned 16, he wanted to get out from under his father's thumb. The only way he could do that was by starting a family. So he found a girl who grew up on a canal boat. He knew how they operated. When they got married, they went to the canal company. And they said, we grew up on canal boats. We know how they work. And because we're educated, we can read, write, and do math. We can run the boat as a business going to lease a boat from the canal company, We're going to buy a set of mules on time and go into business, just like our parents did and just like our kids are going to, because this was the life you wanted in the 19th century. The hours might be long, but the work wasn't dangerous. On this canal, you were paid in gold. If you worked for a coal company or an iron company, you were paid in scrip pieces of paper that only had value on the inflated prices in company mm -hmm. stores, the inflated rents in company housing, and if your husband got killed on the job, you got booted out of that company housing unless you sent one of your kids back into the place and just killed their old man. But here your children were safe, they were learning a marketable skill. Well, there's another job that canal boat kids had to do. You couldn't throw out an anchor to stop a boat. It would damage the clay lining. But you still have to stop the boat. But standing on the shore are my 10-year-old twins. They're not going to stop a 120-ton moving canal boat with muscle. They're going to use science. I throw them the brake line that's attached to the stern of the boat. So you wrap it around the snubbing post that's buried deep in the ground. And as the boat moves on, the friction of that rope going across the snubbing post slows us down. The captain uses the tiller to get us towards the dock. And then, just like in 1829, we use muscle and rope to bring the ride to a conclusion. This is the most dangerous part of a canal boat ride, especially for little kids, because it was in a situation like this where a child could fall overboard, get caught between a moving boat and an immovable object, and then they'd get crushed to death. As one of our crewmates likes to say, that's when little peanuts became peanut butter. Oh, yeah, they can't all be singers. <laughs> so, and this was a good place for women to work because of its Quaker ownership. No one, no one. Because of its Quaker ownership, if your husband was a canal boat captain or a lock tender. He was killed on the job if he was crippled on the job. If he just ran off with some floozy from Glendon, you as his <laughs> wife could take over running the canal boat. You could take over operating the lock. You could be paid the same salary as every man who did the job, and you would be accorded the same rights. The only other place in 19th century America where women had economic parity with men was as a postmistress in the postal system. There's much more information in the National Canal Museum than I can give you on a 45-minute ride. Your green wristbands give you admission. Uh, you pick the nice day to be here at Hugh Moore Park. Whatever you do here, have a great time. Thank you very much for sailing with us.